Hey there everyone, this is Samuel Johnson, and welcome to the final episode of the MTV Spider-Man Retrospectives. And today, we're going to be discussing episode 13 of Spider-Man, the new animated series, Mind Games Part 2. Now, in Part 1, what happened was that Peter, is that Spider-Man wound up crossing paths with a new pair of villains called the Gaines Twins, a brother and sister duo with intense psychic abilities. And how he had encountered them was that they were being transported from one prison to another one because the security system for the, the prison they were in kept shorting out and it was and it kept allowing them to use their psychic powers to essentially torment the guards. However, during transport, one of their henchmen, I'm just going to say, wound up ramming into the transport vehicle they were in and it allowed them to break clear their bonds and ultimately... And essentially, cause, and essentially cause a police chase where, where after they took control of one of the guards and had him shoot the other. Spider-Man was able to come in and was able to break one, the, the, the guard they were controlling free, but when he went to, deal, went to go fight the Gaines twins, they seemed to try, they tried to whammy him and get him under their control. Spider-Man seemingly was able to fight back and restrain them, but at the end of the episode, it was revealed that, that in reality, it was a failure. When they whammied him, they wound up putting Spider-Man into what I'm what is what the trope is called a Lotus Eater world, a fake reality that they that they conjured up that was meant to ascent that was meant to get Spider-Man into the minds that they wanted him to be in. In this case, angry and angry and filled with rage towards the vil the supervillain Craven the Hunter. It turns out uh, who. It turns out they have their own personal vendetta against. You see, they they how the Gaines twins have their powers is because their their parents were experimented on by the KGB, and as a result, because of those experiments, when their mother gave birth to well them, it results in their psychic powers, and the KGB to try and cover their asses wound up hiring Craven the Hunter to kill them and keep them from talking, and as a result, the Gaines twins hate Craven and. Uh -huh. As such, since Spider-Man has a history with Kraven, which again I pointed out in the last episode, kind of feels weird, especially since this follows the continuity from the first Sp Spider-Man movie. They thought that he would be, they thought he would be the perfect candidate to fight to fight him. And sure enough, in the Lotus Eater world, they're able to get Spidey to that mindset by making him believe that Kraven killed MJ, which, well, it does the job. Peter is filled with just filled with endless rage. And after Stanley himself tell, pretty much goads Peter into giving into giving into that vengeance, the the twins wake him up, tell Spidey where Craven that Craven's at currently at a is currently by the docks at a to, at a factory or warehouse whatever, and that he sh that he should go and that he, all he has to do is go there, kill Craven, and he'll get his revenge. And so that's where this episode picks up with Spider Man arriving at the dock front as Craven is preparing to meet with some pr important clients. But and well, pretty much they they and pretty much just fighting. As however, Peter and as such the fight as such the fight is actually a little brutal. It's quick and fast paced as usual, but just like subtle moment movements with Spider Man plus his own general demeanor do show that he really is out for blood here. Something that Craven Craven is able to pick up on because well, this isn't like the usual Spider Man. However, Spider Man is still just a dead set on killing Craven. And he does ultimately manage to, and he almost does it, as he manages to get some webs around Craven's neck and almost hang him from one of the rafters in the building. However, as he does this, he happens to look outside the warehouse, and he notices something. For those of you who didn't watch the last vlog or didn't wa or haven't watched these episodes, something that occurred in the Lotus Eater world was that the Gaines twins wound up release and wound up setting some of Spider-Man's old some of Spidey's foes against him. One of them being Teradax. In the and in the fake world, they wound up taking control of the ESU building that the the ESU Science Center building that was being built. And in the battle, and when Spidey went to go fight them in the battle, a the sign for ESU got knocked off and fell to the street below. No one was killed, but Harry wound up, but Harry was there on the ground on the ground floor, so to speak. And wound up suffering a broken arm. However, when Spidey looks out the window, the sign is there, and the building seems far beyond complete. There is no signs of any scuffle. It looks fine, and this starts causing Spidey to question things a little, especially since during the battle with Craven, Craven mentioned how it's been ages since he since he and Spider-Man actually fought. As a, as 
Spidey begins piecing put, putting the pieces together. He drops Kraven before he can choke or break his neck, and Spidey begins interrogating him about when they actually fought about when they actually fought last. And Kraven does confirm, yeah, it was long ago, which again still feels weird in continuity. And Spidey begins realizing, yeah, he was had, especially when later when the police arrive and he hands Kraven over to them. He asks the lead, he has he asks the officer in charge what's going about about his encounters with previous villains, like with Teradax, Silver Silver Sable, and so forth. And yeah, he confirms that the last time Spidey saw them was the last time we saw them. So yeah, and so Spidey's beginning to realize that things that yep. Yeah, the twins got him, and which is which is doubly confirmed when he gets back to his apartment that night. Sees Harry trying to woo for, uh, one of the girl, one of the one-off girls from a previous episode named Francesca, and sure, yep, his both of his arms are fine. As such, Peter realizes that Peter realizes that something is clearly up, and especially when he asks Harry, "Have you seen MJ?" and Harry mentions that he hasn't. And the only that and while he, they were up to see, while they were going to go see a movie later, she left a note saying that she was with Peter. So Peter's realizing, yeah, MJ's probably in danger. As such, using the bits of scraps of memory he can recall from his time in the real world, he's he manages to go to he goes to Indy the next day and tries giving her detail and gives and tells her about how he's looking for the little twins' warehouse because he does have because he does like I said those are the, the details he can recall and well and. Eventually, they're able to narrow it down to a warehouse by the docks, to the but to the docks as Peter's able to get some more identifying information as it's across the street from a church. But, at, but Indy of course thinks that something is up because Peter's cover story was that he wanted to take a picture of a building, but he was daydreaming and can't find it anymore. But why is he going to all this effort to find it? So Peter ends up admitting that he thinks MJ is in danger and that he doesn't want to talk about it. And he just bolts. Indy decides to take this as a personal challenge as she thinks that wherever Peter's going there must be a story so she wants to go there and act and actually well be and actually get the scoop before he does as such it essentially becomes a race and sure enough as Spidey and Indy are going to the warehouse the twins watch the news and yeah they are not happy that Craven's just been arrested however they still have their ace in the hole you see like we mentioned last week like no, not last week but last vlog the last video the twins as extra insurance kidnapped MJ because well they there was that off chance that Peter could break free of their mental control and while MJ may not be and while MJ isn't exactly tied up they are essentially keeping her in place with their mental powers causing her that every time she seems to be going free they trap her in a little dream prison where she's where she's trying to escape from the lizard as such, they decide that they can still get their revenge on Craven. All they need to do is give Spider-Man the right incentive. And so they end up calling him because with their time in his head, they know who he is. And so they are and so they pretty much just tell him, kill Craven, or we're killing MJ. And of course, Spite and so of course Spidey is just doing his best to keep them on the phone and keep them from actually doing anything to her. But thankfully he is successful, and which actually leads to one of my favorite scenes in this whole episode, as he's just talking his, as he's just talking the girl of the twins, her, he's just talking the girl's twins ear off. And as the, as he keeps talking and talking, she's speaking, she gets ready to hang up. She says, okay. It's like, he better be dead by the next time I call. It's like, okay, fine. But one more thing. And the twins just look horrified as they look at each other and just say, he's here. Look over and Spidey just swings in. I, and I, I don't know. I just find that hilarious. Just the sheer, oh shit, uh, expressions on their faces, which I love. I thought was great. However, they manage to hit Spider-Man with mental waves and make a, and make an escape. And Spider-Man, while Spider-Man is able to take care of the henchman that was chasing at their lone henchman, he still has to go after them. And they both want to making a run for the roof. As such, Sp as such, Peter gets a, gets MJ free, and they run out. Now, in the meantime, Indy arrives and tells the guy and tells the guy dri tells her driver that she's not on five minutes because he can just leave her. But Spider-Man does chase the twins up to the roof, and while he does, and while he does seem to have the boy of twin cornered, the girl twin comes right, comes up afterwards and starts opening fire on and starts opening fire on him. Spidey is able to disarm her, but she immediately hits him with one of her mental powers to try and knock him out. Spider-Man does his best to power through it and get to her, but it's clear it's a str it's a struggle just to even do that. Eventually, though, he does get to her, and he and he ends up getting her his hands around her throat. And as he keeps struggling against her, he they end up getting close to the edge of the building, 
and one more blast from her mental powers causes him to get woozy and unfortunately they're so close to the edge that when that when spidey lets go she ends up falling over the side now while of course spidey is not a killer this isn't exactly a big thing because she was trying to kill him so you could still claim self-defense but then spidey starts hearing the boy twin laughing he then turns around and as he's laughing his sister walks out from behind him also laughing and she then tells Spider-Man to take another look over the edge. And when Spidey looks, he sees Indy. It turns out that when the girl twins supposedly burst onto the, onto the roof and open fire on him, the twins hit Spidey again with another whammy, making him believe that Indy was one of the, was it, was one of the Gaines twins and was, and well, because of their and well spidey has now pushed her off of a building and to make matters worse people saw it a bunch of people in the opposite in a building nearby were looking outside and they were not being hit by the Gaines twins powers they from their perspective saw spider-man push indy off of a roof and with the twins kind of being further back, it makes it look like Spider-Man tried to kill Indy. Something that leaves him horrified. Now, faced with the knowledge that Indy is potentially not is potentially injured, Spidey goes down to her and manages to get her to care. As after the commercial break. We cut to a, a, a hospital, and she's and we see Indy hooked up to like various life support machines, and and while she's still alive, unfortunately the unfortunately she's not doing well. She is at she is essentially at death's door right now, and the doc and despite all the tests the doctors have done, they have t they have pretty much confirmed that Indy may not ever wake up. Something that is horrifying, Peter. And while Harry and MJ are there to offer support, unfortunately, because of the witness testimonies, they're not exactly on Spider-Man's side either. Which I think is a little weird for MJ, considering that she was held by the twins for at least a day and is probably aware of their mental power. So I feel like she should that she would still give Spider-Man at least a little benefit of the doubt. Like, even with all the witnesses, she would know he probably didn't know. Even if she would still be angry with him for pushing Indy over the edge, and rightly so. But Harry, Harry's essentially defaulted back to how he was at the beginning of the series just hating spider-man and thinking that this is just confirmation not helped by the fact that and after he says this that they the, the empire one news station the the empire one news that comes on the tv in the in indy's hospital room and j and j jonah jameson is on there and is essentially calling spider-man out telling him a bunch of witnesses saw it we and this can and i've been telling you people for years that he's a menace and this just confirms it He's a monster. He's a he's a mur he's a, he's an attempted murderer. He either needs to hang his webs up or get the hell out of town. And as we learn later, a good chunk of New York is now behind him on this, which unfortunately is not helping Peter's mental state. While Harry and MJ go off, we see go eventually do leave. Peter, you can Peter is, is unfortunately still not in a good mo mindset. However, while he does blame himself for what's going, what's happening to Indy, he knows that the Gaines twins are still out there, and he can't just leave them, leave them to do what they will. As such, after taking some of the sedatives from the hospital, he ends up tracking down the Stan Lee cameo. They do give it, they do reveal the character's name at one point in the episode, but it's mentioned like only once. So I'm just gonna still call him Stan Lee, and it turns out his character actually owns a majority of warehouses throughout new york which is how people and and, so, and it, yeah that's why the twins were using him for not just the illusion but for the where for just for also their base 
as such, Spider-Man managed to track him down and he essentially threatens him into telling him where the twins are, and he does end up, he does eventually give it. But and so, and it turns out that this was actually that the twins with this whole thing with Indy, it was Plan B. My guess is that they were originally going to do it with MJ, but and Indy was just a happy accident. But it's the exact same result. It turns out that with Spider-Man discredited, they think that they can now just go into the criminal underworld of New York and just take over, which. I guess is this meant to be just like a consolation prize since they obviously wanted Spider-Man to kill Kraven, but they essentially just say, take the victories where you will. Unfortunately, as they're celebrating this victory, Spider-Man shows up and takes them out one by one. By one. First, he ends up webbing the sister's, sh sister's boots to the ground, and, so, and the brother, unfortunately, is not paying attention to this because they just happen to be walking and then her foot gets stuck, and they're closing, like, doors to this warehouse they're in, and before she can warn her brother that Spider-Man is there, he ends up closing the door in her face, and Spider-Man comes in and, well, unfortunately, away from his sister, the the guy twin's mental facu mental powers aren't as great. And so while he does manage to throw Spider-Man around a little bit, at the end of the day, Spider-Man is able to hit him with a good chunk with a good dose of the sedative and knock him out. Unfortunately for Spidey, though, the other twin got free of her webbing and comes barreling into the warehouse in a propane truck. While Spider-Man does try fighting, is does his best to try and break to get the, to get the control of the truck away from her. Her mental powers are still. It turns out her mental powers are actually far greater than her brother's, and she begins screwing with his mind, making him see Indy, begging him not to hurt her. Unfortunately for the the girl twin, she should have been paying attention to her. She should have been paying attention to her surroundings because as Spider-Man is holding on for dear life on the hood. He happens to look behind him. He look, happens to look behind. He happens to look behind him because he's looking into the windshield and sees that they're driving right into electrical what into an electric box. And with this knowledge in mind, Peter just calmly slips off of the truck, and as the girl twin sees what she's driving into, she tries to hit the brakes, but it unfortunately, just causes her to skid into the box. And upon the spark getting hit, upon igniting the spark in the propane truck. It causes the whole building to explode. While Spider-Man does manage to make it out of the blast, his suit's clearly in tatters. But, unfortunately, but as for the twins, well, I doubt that they'll be walking away anytime soon, if they're alive. And so, with that in mind, Spidey just swings away, leaving the leaving what's left of the twins in the rubble. Of this destroyed building. In the meantime, though, we then cut to the next morning as we see Peter in his room as with with a suitcase containing his Spider-Man outfit. Before before he just seems before he can do anything with it, MJ ends up coming in after Peter hides the suit, of course, and she's clear and uh, Peter is still distraught, not doing well, and MJ is trying her best to comfort him be there for him show him that she cares and still loves him and wants to be there for him in this trying time but unfortunately with the, the because of peter's guilt and self-loathing and anger he's just not in the right mindset and so while mj is doing her best to be near him he tells her i can't do this and mj clearly hurt says i'm sorry for bothering you for giving him a quick peck on the cheek and leaving. As such, Peter takes out the, the suitcase carrying his suit and then fills it with bricks. And then, well, the end of the episode involves Peter just walking through the streets of New York with as he begins monologuing about how how the life of a superhero just is just it just costs you more than you would like. Especially when people that you love end up getting hurt. You push some people away and end up unintentionally hurting them. Some of the, some may, some people may just end up hating you. Or in the case of Indy, people that they love will just lose everything. And so Peter decides, if being a hero is going to keep hurting those I love, it's just going to keep taking things away, then I don't want it anymore. And so, with the one final thought, Peter takes the suitcase and chucks it into the Hudson River.
thinking to himself, Goodbye, Spider-Man. And the episode ends with Peter looking at his reflection, briefly seeing the image of himself in the suit before walking away. Now, I've talked about this finale before. Not in this vlog series, but in a previous vlog, The Phantom Perspectives. Specifically, when I talked about their... When I talked about Danny, the final episode of Danny Phantom, wherein... In that special, Danny wound up, got, Danny wound up clashing with these group of ghost hunters that Vlad Masters had created, called Masters Blasters, and how they were beating Danny to the punch at every turn, and, pe and people were just, and the people of Amity Park just started loving them more and turning their backs on Danny Phantom because they're stupid. That's really the only reason for it, and how because and Danny feeling like that people didn't need him anymore, that he was unwanted, decided that he should just stop being Danny Phantom, and he did. I thought that ending was stupid, and I compared it to the ending of this show, wherein a similar circumstance happens with Peter, that there's a miss... Uh, not the, okay, not the same circumstance, but a similar situation, say for certain key details, how... The people of New York now loathe Spider-Man. Everybody has a negative opinion of him, and Peter eventually gives up the gives up the identity. Why I think it works here, as opposed to in the finale of Danny Phantom, is because Danny's choice in that episode was based on purely selfish reasons. That, which not only didn't make sense for the character, but also was just didn't make sense overall. Because previously, we've seen that Danny doesn't really care about public opinion when it comes to his superhero career. But now, which, to be fair, he does want people to like him, of course. But to, the po to get to the point where he's just started thinking, well, they don't really like me anymore. Maybe I should just give up this whole hero thing. I thought it was stupid. And while you could argue, well, he didn't officially give it up until the Blasters attacked his own home, well, that's, I think, stupid. He could have easily fought them off, and he knows he's capable of it. Especially if he knew that this was all just a ploy by Vlad to get at him. But here, in this episode, Peter's decision makes sense. Earlier in the series, I mentioned how Indy was essentially this show's Gwen Stacy. And this is the episode where that showcases it. Because like Gwen Stacy, Indira Daimanji was meant to be someone close to Peter. Someone that he grew with, that he grew close, that someone that he became emotionally attached to, began to have feelings for, began to actually have something very intimate with. And from her introduction episode, we've seen that relationship develop between her and Peter, seeing them click on various occasions, seeing her helping him out, getting closer to him, not just in his Peter Parker, but as Spider-Man, even if the, even if she didn't know it. And so seeing that happen and seeing that relationship continue to develop, it makes this finale hurt. Because like with Gwen Stacy, the tragedy is that this is someone that she that it's not this is not just so that someone that Peter cares about getting hurt this is something he's personally responsible for like with the tragedy of Gwen Stacy ultimately it's a villain that set it all in motion but like with the de like with her death like with Gwen Stacy's death the action was still Spider-Man's in the comics he wound up accidentally killing Gwen Stacy by her getting thrown off a bridge, him shooting a web at her, and the kickback snapped her neck. Here, while the twins were ones that whammied Spider-Man, he is the one that pushed her, that pushed Indy off of the roof. And that guilt hits him like a truck. And that, even if you, even if, if you can, even if he tried to convince himself, no, that was the twins doing, imagine being in that mindset knowing that you were there, that you had your hands around around the throat of someone you loved, and then 
per and then purposefully and willfully pushed her pushed her off of the building. That is what Peter is going through. Not just the fact that she's been hurt, but that he's the one that was responsible. Now, you could argue that Indy is probably better off than Gwen, because at least she's alive. But honestly, I would think that it's that her situation isn't that great is still probably just as bad. Because while she may not be dead, she is at death's door. Everything that she was is almost is essentially gone. She is in a coma from which the doctors say she may never wake up from. And Peter again has to learn has to live with the guilt and despair that do making that decision comes that comes from making that decision. And it's not helped by the fact that people hate him. What may, and what makes the hate work here as opposed to the finale of Danny Phantom is because, again, they don't have the full story. But, and what makes it, but, and of course, again, Peter beating himself up. Peter blames himself, Peter is blaming, when it comes to dissenters, Peter is his, is the loudest voice. And as people are tell, are yelling for Spider-Man's head on a pike, Peter isn't doing anything to try and defend himself or say, no, the twins were responsible. No, he just takes it. And it just keeps building to him. It just keeps building and adding on to his guilt. And as a result, by the end of the episode, when he does finally decide to stop being mm -hmm. Spider-Man, it makes sense and fits with his character. He does After all, Indy was hurt because of her connection to him like twins pro intentionally made her a target because they saw that she was close to Pe the closest peter when they went through his head so with the knowledge that being spider-man is hurting those he loves of course peter would decide i can't do this anymore I can't live with these feelings, with this pain, this anger. As a result, his dis as such, when he, in, the, in the final shot, when he just chucks the suit into the river, it's powerful and it's bitter. Especially when the episode, especially when as he talks about the people he's hurt, you see the pe you see his friends hurting. MJ and emotion is emotionally distraught because Peter just is now is because now that the gap between her and Peter is even larger. You see Harry angrier than ever, over angrier than ever because of what Spider Man did, and Indy in the hospital bed, holding on. All of that just show emphasizes just all the things that being Spider Man has taken away or damaged for Peter, and so of course, and so honestly, his decision at the end of this episode to just quit, it def it works. Because it works. It's powerful. It's gripping. And it's just, honestly, a, d a darn good decision. And a really strong cliffhanger. My, I'm get, I think, although maybe a little too good, admittedly, because, like I said, this was the mm -hmm. final episode of the series. Now, they clearly left enough doors open with this finale that mm -hmm. they could come back. And I'm assuming that if they did come back, we would have seen Peter reclaim the spider-man mantle even if it would be even if it was reluctantly like maybe a new threat is coming that nobody can deal with and peter because of his overwhelming sense of responsibility makes a new spider-man costume and goes to face it even though everyone in new york still hates him and he's wanted for attempted murder so i think that if the series had continued that's where we would have gone but as the finale it really hits hard it really leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. Not the bad kind of bitter, though. Although you could argue that there's no other, that there's no such thing as a good bitter, but the kind of bitter that definitely makes you, that definitely kind of hits you emotionally, because again, you see the pain that Peter is in. You see the consequences of his actions, of what's hap of the of you see the you see this the what the remains of his life just kind of fall apart little by little. And, of course, with all that in mind, it definitely makes the decision that much stronger. And as for the rest of the episode, I think what makes it, what helps, too, is that the, is, well, the villains. The Gaines twins are honestly 
really creepy villains. Whenever we see them, they whenever we see them, they always look they always look like sickly or pale with like sunken in eyes and their voices are always low. They have a certain way of talking to them. Like it's low or monotone or just kind of or just kind of eerie and wispy. It's like there is just something off about these people from the instant you see them. And that is continuously showcased throughout the episode throughout both episodes just kind of seeing them being talking quietly or creepily or getting or, ang or getting angry or seeing the angry glares there was like one like go even like one scene that re that really kind of creeped me out was when the twins were gloating to spider-man that he pushed indy like as you see the the girl twin tell spider-man to look over the side of the building you can see them the you can see her brother just standing next to her and he just got this really fucking creepy smile on his face as he just looks gleeful that spider-man is just good that this is gonna hurt spider-man that badly and honestly it really freaking works and throughout the episode you just have this sense of something's off about them and it continues to showcase that especially with when you see them using their mental powers like you can hear their voices echoing all across the ep throughout through everywhere just like they're just like a haunting mm -hmm. like they're just like haunted vo haunting voices in your head which is a propos considering their powers and pretty much just every scene with them just gives you the shivers because you just know these are these people are all well at the same time they do showcase that they are clearly brother and sister as we see them bicker we see them get along we see them mm. argue it's really interesting it's really interesting stuff and while they aren't the most and while they're not the most fleshed out as they're kind of one note they just want revenge at the same time i think they have enough there that that makes up for it to still make them intimidating and creepy hold on one second sorry about that dog now as i was saying again the game swims are creepy i think when a, i think again i think another thing that works about it i think is essentially just the fan service throughout both parts of the special the whole episode the whole finale does feel like a culmination of the whole of the series up to this point not entirely but enough so that you can feel things converging in a sense we got that in the first part when we saw the previous villains make a comeback even if they weren't the real ones it was still kind of cool seeing these references and other villains from previous from previous episodes come back like seeing spider-man duke out with pterodax or silver sable or again or in the case of craven the hunter just seeing him even making a debut in the episode though again i still would argue that that doesn't really make a lot of sense or even seeing peter trying to take steps to m improve things with his spider sona as we see him as we see him confess to mj in the fake world and then in the real world learn that yeah that that, that was actually what would happen of course and of course also having the stan lee cameo be what happened last week last time and then of course the, then there's the stuff with MJ going up again, having the hallucination attack from the lizard. Or, in this case, the reactions from what happened when to Indy being pushed off the building by Spider-Man. I feel like that what makes this work too... Well, I do have my problems with it in a little bit, a, a little bit in the case, such as in the case of MJ, who, like I said, I feel like should be more willing to give Spider-Man the benefit of the doubt since she essentially since she was the, since she had been captured by the Gaines twins and thus is aware of their mental powers harry in the meantime i think that one i feel is the one that is the most pivotal after all prior to this two-parter we had seen harry clearly start cl starting to question his hatred of spider-man and the death of his and spider-man's hand in the death of his father because after all if you saw the first spider-man movie then you know his father was the green goblin so and di and died while they and died in battle and so harry not knowing that thinks that peter just that spider-man just straight up killed his dad though why that's not public knowledge i have absolutely no idea but now but by the end of the la of but by, by the end of the episode before this two-parter you saw that harry was questioning how th where things were going with, with his with spider-man his own feelings towards him and whether his hatred was actually warranted but here you see that all come crashing down and harry's reaction i think makes the most sense after all every interaction with spider-man he had before this he would had just chipped away at the facade that harry had built up in his mind just little by little you saw that until eventually harry began questioning 
whether it was the hatred was warranted and if Spider-Man was actually a good person or if his dad or if his dad was doing something behind behind closed doors. But with Indy's death, Harry takes the most is the one that cha that that ends up backpedaling the most and his back and his reactions kind of keep him closed off. After all, he's angry at Spider-Man just says good riddance, have him get thrown out of town. And by the end in the and by the end when you see that clip, you see him just so angry and bitter that when Francesca tries to talk to him because they were clearly hitting it off, he just ignores her and blows her off. It's clear that he's that essentially it's like he's under the mindset of I've been fooled. How what was I thinking? I I, I thought I could trust that wall crawling menace. Now I know I know for a fact. Now I know that that, that I was right to be angry with him. And especially in the case with MJ, while I do again, like I said, I think it's weird to see her essentially close to not give Spidey the benefit of the doubt. Her reaction also makes sense. After all, while after all, earlier in the series, Peter and her broke up. They and she was clear, and they clearly were close, and they clearly cared about each other. They clearly still had feelings for one another. But with it, but with the introduction of Indy, a roadblock was put in the pet was was thrown in her way. And as a result, she and Peter split. And every attempt that she made to try and rekindle whatever they had just kept ending in failure. And now with Indy... Go and now and the only person that, that MJ seemed to have any other connection with was Spider-Man. Not after all, she didn't know that Spider-Man was Peter Parker. So so no, so believing that Spider-Man is really a murderer, she feels alone. It's like she's... She feels alone, and she sees Peter hurting. So naturally, she goes to him to try and comfort him. But with but because of his self loathing and hatred, he doesn't or self loathing and anger towards himself. Peter doesn't want to be around MJ. So that ends up hitting her even harder. So she essentially, she's being hurt too because of this. She's being isolated from those she believes that she loves. Harry is not talking to anyone. Peter is closing her off for reasons she doesn't understand. And the last person that she thought she could trust, Spider-Man, she believes is a murder is an attempted murderer. So naturally, she's she's kind of she's not exactly doing well. So I think she's not exactly doing well, and that actually really hurt and that does hurt. So I'll give credit. I do like I like seeing just kind of, and so I do like that they do showcase the unfortunate side effects of that, and the emotional states do lead to continue adding to the bitter and bitterness of the ending. That something truly was lost in all this, and that it makes and by the end you're wondering if they can if things can ever be recovered, if things can ever be fixed and put back to normal. And unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately because this is the only, this uh, this series only lasted one season, we are not getting that answer. We ne we don't know if Peter will ever rekindle will ever re will ever rekindle his relationship with MJ. We don't know if Indy will get better. We don't we don't see we won't know if Harry will finally get over his hatred of Spider Man or if it's just going to get worse again and potentially steer him down a dark path. We don't know what's going to happen, but it's the, but and as a result, while the ending definitely feels powerful, it also leaves you wanting. Like you want to know what happens next and how things are going to go from here. But again, because the show is canceled, we're never going to know. Which sucks because, quite honestly, this show is not bad. It's not a bad show at all. I'm not going to claim that it's perfect. It's clearly aged a little from when it first aired. But for what we have, it is still really nice. The characters are 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 well written and are ha and have definable personalities. The relationships they have with each other do feel very real and are cont and are continually showcased and and expanded on and and further developed with each episode. The humor can be really nice. Neil Patrick Harris as Peter Parker in Spider Man honestly was a good choice. Was a good choice. Well, he well. While I do believe that there are stronger versions, I do think that he provided an excellent performance as both of them, though there were some times that I think he could have upped the drama in the vo in his voice. And the voice actors they got for Harry and, and Harry and MJ were nice. The villain selections were all really unique and interesting, with maybe like one or two exceptions. I liked the takes that they had on all on or on or already existing Spider-Man material, such as the Kingpin, which was just straight up based on the iteration from the Daredevil movie, which I thought was honestly one of the best versions of the character. Electro, I thought was really well done, 
well done, especially when considering his backstory, his backstory and how they should continue the portrayal. The lizard kept the tragedy aspect while still being terrifying, and Silver Sable was well, and Silver Sable was definitely a nice introduction. I think maybe she was the weakest, but even then, is the weakest one. She was still really good, still a lot of fun. Definitely showcased that how much of a threat she was, and just how close and how single-minded she was in her approach. So I like her. So I liked that. And of course, the original villains they had were still nice. Teradax was a gr was, were great villains. The Gaines twins, as I just said to this vlog, were creepy as hell. Shikata definitely felt like a... Shikata, while I do believe you... Well, de de well, definitely leaving you wanting was definitely a capable... Ver was, I think, definitely a capable villain as she wasn't just motivated by by just simple, I want I want greed or power. She was motivated by honor and wanting a good fight. So I thought that was really mm -hmm. cool. I think the only villain that I kind of, that left me from that honestly left me disappointed was Talon because it, they really should have I feel expanded on her character like they had something set up they clearly wanted to do something with her but because the show got canceled after one season nothing got expanded on with her so I'm gonna knock a point for that knock a point for that and unfortunately there are other aspects of the show that again do believe you wanting. There are some minor continuity hiccups here and there from the movies that don't really add up when you stop and think about them. Case in point, going back to the Flash Thompson episode, it feels weird that he'd be pursuing MJ at all, considering that in the first movie, MJ and Flash dated in high school, and he was the one that broke it off with her. So it feels weird that he's pursuing her and MJ is even interested in in dating him at all, even with, if he's acting all nice and eloquent while he's while he's smart. So I'm gonna dock a point for that. Again, there's that little there's the continuity hiccup with Craven, who what which I really do not know where he could possibly fit in the timeline of the first movie and this show. So I don't really get that myself. And on and. While I do admit that the animation looks stylized and cool and is nice to look at, unfortunately, it does also look a little dated. I've seen cel shaded CGI done better in other productions and shows and even games. And it look and while this is definitely and while this definitely still looks impressive, it definitely it's not as it's clear that the technology is still being perfected. And the show definitely the, and the show uh, and the show is def and while the show didn't do a bad job with it, it clearly didn't. It's clear that it's older. If, I, if that's what I mean. On top of that, while the action scenes were interesting to watch, they really didn't feel as fast paced as they could. There was definitely some weird jumping around with the editing as it as it as it, as it sped up and slowed down at, when it tried closing in on certain shots. Certain characters were just were introduced and then and then just kind of, for, for like one episode and then forgotten. And I'm just going to unfortunately say this, Peter and MJ's relationship really did not grab me. Like, while there were times when it felt like their relationship was taking steps forward, it also felt like with MJ said, it feels like there was a wall in there. And I know that the idea was that they were trying to set up that Peter and MJ were distant because a Pe uh, because Peter was trying to was, was trying to keep her at arm's length because of his Spider-Man duties. But at the same time, they did not really click that much. I bought that they were friends. I definitely did. That part, I think, really worked out well. But as a couple, they really did not click. They had their cute moments, and there were times that I think it worked. But as a couple, it didn't feel like they fully clicked, which I found to be a little disappointing. And I think that's another thing that made the what happened to Indy in the final episode work so well, because they showed that Peter and her, they were a match made in heaven. They were both news aficionados with big brains who could support and talk to one another while still getting lost in their own world. One of my favorite scenes with them was in the Flash Memory episode where they're both technically having two different conversations with each other but still are able to keep up with one another. Because it, you know, it's like Peter's talking about where their relationship is going while she's talking about these two biker twins who are supposed to be... who's whose IQs are in the double digits and then suddenly became super geniuses and they seem to be having these two different conversations about it but then by the end it's clear that they are both still paying attention to one another as they reciprocate what the other was saying and are able to and are able to counter it like Peter said like when she like when she says where's our relationship going it's like where, where do you think our relationship is going where do you think our relationship is going I'm thinking how did these two idiots that could barely tie their shoelaces suddenly become geniuses like, it's just, it's clear that they really did click, and I think, honestly, were better together. Whereas MJ, 
it felt like that it felt like that she was trying to connect with Peter. And while Peter definitely was putting up barriers because of his activities as Spider-Man, at the same time, any attempts that she could that she had that she try that she did to try and get to know him always felt like she was just pushing a little too hard. Well, I think the thing that broke the camel's back being what happened in the Head Over Heels episode when she tried pushing that secret exchanging thing, which even she admitted was put was not exactly a good decision. It definitely reeked of desperation considering that in the previous episode she saw Peter and Indy ma making out. So, again, I think that is a flaw with the episode. Peter and MJ's relationship really did not work as well as the writers would have hoped. There's also, I think, in one... One minor example: How some villains don't get as get, don't get as developed. While the while the lizard definitely was a strong villain for the episode he was introduced, unfortunately, because the show kept trying to stick to the "some villains must die" quota, he he only lasts one episode. While Electro definitely gets better treatment with him, as they at least had one episode with him prior to his transformation. Even he falls into that same pole as well, as we have one episode with him as Max Dillon, one episode that shows him turning into Electro, but only doing Electro stuff in the last third, and then the, and then the next episode we see him, he gets again killed off. So it really feels... so. And while I liked what they did with Electro in the series, it also feels kind of disappointing. Because quite a lot of villains, they either they they because there are because there are at least a good, a good chunk of villains here that they end up killing off or having a they end up killing off, and because of the nature of the show, a good nut chunk of them are either arrested and never seen again, or they're just le or their fates are left ambiguous. So I'm gonna so that one is kind of a lesser flaw, but still a flaw that if you look hard enough. But with that said, I still think the show is worth watching. It's still a really good show, and it really does well in showcasing the drama of Spider-Man while still having some fun. I do while the action, the like I said, while the animation is dated, it's still fun to look at and really interesting to see. The writing is clever. I love how they develop relationships and so forth between the characters and how they develop. Indy, I think, made for a good Gwen Stacy analog because she was really fun, really nice, with some good was really clever to see, and that made the tragedy and that made the, what happened to her ultimately feel more tragic because you got to know her and thus cared about her. And everything. The villains were all the villains were very were very much a, a unique a unique cavalcade of characters that offered something unique and interesting with with each episode. I loved seeing that. I loved just I loved the I loved how the, how Peter did act smart and we did see more of the of the quippy action Spider-Man while Peter also being intelligent and trying to rationalize a, trying to rationalize and find ways around beating the villains. The supporting cast I think was was nice and had their own moments and backstories and arcs that I thought were interesting and the finale I still thought was really well to, was really good and well and left you on a strong cliffhanger that yes left you wanting but definitely could stick with but definitely stuck with you in terms of its emotional power so on the whole if my craptacular vlogs have made you interested in this show in any way I recommend seeking it out it's not a perfect show there are definitely other spider-man shows that I think are a little better but for what it is, it's still a lot of fun. has has great character has great character moments, great villains, great fun, some very fun, some fun action here and there, some interesting dilemmas and story arcs and drama. Overall, and overall, it's still just worth time. And I still think it's worth your time watching. So by all means, if you're interested, check them out. But if you're but if you are interested in collecting the series, I recommend not collecting it the way I did. I want to buying the series through the individual DVDs, which did give me a majority of the episodes, but ultimately makes me missing one, Head Over Heels, which I wound up buying on iTunes. And as a result, if you and as such, if you do want the series in its complete form, get the complete series DVD. It has the episodes in the intended air order, which is how I watch them, and it has and no up nothing is and nothing is missing. So by all means, if you're interested. Find this series, check it out in any of its forms, show that people that, that, that show that it is still loved and that people still want to see more of it. And while I doubt that it'll get renewed, at the very least, I would love to see Marvel get draw put more attention on the show because it really is. I feel like it is one of those hidden gems that if you take your time, to, if you took time out of your day to watch, you would have a good time by the end. So, yeah, that's about it. I really don't have much to say, but. For anyone who actually wa that w that's watched these videos, 
watch these, all these videos from beginning to end and was potentially interested in seeing where the show went, I thank you for your time. I'm glad I was able to keep you momentarily distracted with these craptacular, unrehearsed vlogs. And while there were times that I definitely feel like could have been better, it was still fun to go back and watch this show. And I'm for anybody that actually want that stuck around with me, I thank you for, for coming with me on this journey. It was fun to do, and I hope you and I hope that you enjoyed the ride. As for where we're gonna go next, well, next week we're gonna we're gonna be doing the Morbius vlog, the real one this time, I promise. But the week after, we're gonna have to start a new vlog series. And I think maybe we should go back to Cartoon Network. Though for the vlog for the for the show that I plan to look at, we're not gonna be looking at one that I grew up with, but one that but a show that is over and I think is still worth remembering and talking about. If you're so if you're interested, you can go check that series out. But if you're not, that's totally fine. But if you do want to learn more about what I do online, you could go follow me on social media. I've got a Twitter at Mask of Fate, a Tumblr, which is Mr. Multiversity Two. And I also and I ha and I have an Instagram also Mr. Multiversity too. So if you're interested in following me on social media, you can find them there. I'll leave the links in the description later. But for now, our journey into the MTV Spider Verse has concluded. If you don't want to see any more of me, completely understand. But and I completely understand, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. My name's Samuel Johnson, and if you so choose, I'll see you next time when we look at a new vlog series. Have a good night and take care.